what is crack a lacking everybody You're back with Mr. Burger. Tonight we're going to be taking a look at this new version of this Rage Challenge Spawner Troll deck. Now this is a deck that I covered a while ago when the Rage Challenge was out originally the first time. And you know, much to my surprise, that video, although it was dated, all of a sudden saw a big resurgence of views. You know, not a big resurgence, but you know, a noticeable resurgence for my channel. So I figured, okay, since the Rage Challenge is something that was new, it was a new challenge that was introduced for the first time, the last time that it was around, even though that video was a little bit old, it was, you know, one of the few Rage Challenge videos out there. And I was like, this, this video is doing well, this is a really fun deck, so I want to cover it again. So I tried that same deck. I tried the same spawner deck that I did for that previous video, and I had some fun with it. In fact, I had some epic comebacks, and I might do a video just on those epic comebacks that I did with that deck. But one thing that I was noticing is that a lot of people were running, you know, of course, obviously, counter decks to these spawner troll decks. And one of the things that I was seeing a lot, or two of the things that I was, was seeing a lot, actually, was the bowler, first of all, and the magic archer. So I decided, okay... I'm seeing lightning a lot too, but I'm going to stick with that poison instead of lightning, but I'm going to adapt, I'm going to take that bowler and that magic archer in there. And there's a reason for that. The, the old one ran Zappies, and Zappies, as you may know, kind of got a nerf recently. So the Zappies aren't as nearly as effective as they used to be, so I thought I would give this a try. So I tried it for a while, and uh, if you haven't checked out that old video already, you can go ahead and take a look at that one and see that version of the deck. And I did pretty well with that deck, and I know some people did get 12 wins with that deck, although I didn't. So I tried this one out this time around, and I actually managed to get 12 wins. It was really nice. It was a really good feeling, because it's been a while since I've gotten 12 wins in the challenge. I think the only one I've ever gotten 12 wins in before is probably like a draft challenge or something like that. I think I've gotten like 10 or 11 in the Classic, but not quite 12 yet. And as I said before, you know, I'm not that great of a player. I don't try to, you know, claim that I'm that great of a player. I just like sharing decks and strategies and things like that. So I actually managed to get 12 wins with this deck, which is pretty significant for me. You know, it's a pretty notable achievement. This was a nice feeling for sure. Uh, and I wanted to make sure to share this particular variation with you guys, even though the Rage Challenge is definitely over by the time that you're seeing this particular video. But hey, maybe you're watching it a month or two from now, once the Rage Challenge has rolled back around and it's being featured again. Now in this particular replay, you'll notice here that I actually, it, I was taking forever to load in. And for some reason, I was having this issue on my phone where I couldn't, like, by the time I had loaded in, my whole tower, like, I don't, I was not putting anything down right now because I was not loaded into the game. My loading bar was still going at, like, 83, 84, 85%. Finally, I put a pump down. You can see I finally get into the game. And I just wanted to show you guys that this deck has that potential to build up so much that you can get a counter push going and it's just a huge wave going. Not even a counter push, just a massive wave going, and win no matter what. So even though I completely lost that tower for no reason and leaked a bunch of elixir early on there, I pulled this match together and I was able to win this particular one. So that being said, let's talk more about this deck and the intricacies of it and the strategies behind it. So I did get 12 wins with this deck as I showed you, or as I told you guys already. So I actually am able to give you a lot of my own personal tips from personal experience rather than just from doing external research and just kind of, you know, theory crafting behind the deck, given the cards in it, and, you know, watching other replays and other videos and things like that. This is, most of these tips are going to just come directly from these 12 wins that I got with this deck personally. So, let's get started. Pumping up. Pumping up is your priority. So make sure that you get those elixir pumps down as much as possible as often as possible. That elixir advantage is key in this deck. That's what allows for these amazing pump, uh, these amazing comebacks. Pumping up and getting that elixir advantage. And so this is going to be your biggest priority all game for all of, you know, basically the entire game. For every strategy that you're doing, for all the cycle that you're going through, you're cycling back to that pump. You're trying to get that pump up trying to get that elixir advantage, that is your biggest priority. You want to get that pump down as often as possible, so you want to cycle back to that pump if you can, and try to get another one down, try to get a second one down, try to get a third one down, 
And you can see, even though I lost that tower early on, I was able to build up a massive push, and he pretty much just gave up there at the end, because he saw that he couldn't do anything about that wave. Now, you might be thinking, okay, yeah, pump up, but every time I pump, they lightning my pump and get chip damage on my tower. Okay, yeah, that's true. So let's work around that. This deck, practically everything in this deck other than the spells, is like spell bait. It's like fireball or poison or lightning or rocket bait. And you're going to be seeing a lot of poison, a lot of fireball, and a lot of lightning. I don't see a lot of rocket in this challenge, but definitely the other ones. You see those a lot for sure. Because, uh, probably because they have bigger area of effect. So, what you're going to do is you're going to bait out their spells using like your magic archer, or maybe even your bowler, not really your bowler, but mostly your magic archer, your swarm units, like the big swarm that you get from all the spawner buildings, or even the spawner buildings themselves. They might use the, you, maybe you'll get a whole bunch of spawner buildings in one area, and then they finally give in and fireball that, then you immediately put your pump down on the other side, and they don't have that fireball down, um, you know, in cycle for a long time, and you take advantage of that, and you can get that elixir advantage going. And the way that this particular challenge works, those pumps get an even bigger benefit. It's not like they're raged and they just work a little bit faster and then die a little bit quicker. They gain more elixir overall than they normally would in a regular match. So getting those elixir pumps down is just, it's paramount, it's huge, it's, it's hugely important in this particular deck for various reasons. So bait it out with your swarm, bait it out with your magic archer, bait it out with your you know, spawner buildings, I'm talking about their, their spells, whatever spells they might have. And then get those pumps down, try to pump up as many of those pumps as you can, and then you'll just build up such a massive wave with your spawner buildings at that point because you have that elixir advantage, and they'll be spending all their elixir on trying to counter your wave, they'll be able to do nothing about it, and you'll just absolutely overwhelm them. Now on the note of cycling back to your pump, you want to generally use your cheaper buildings in the first two minutes. Um, this allows you to get back to your pump faster. So if, even if they do have fireball or lightning or whatever, and they're constantly using it on your building, on your uh, pump, then you know you cycle quicker with putting things like your furnace and your goblin hunt, even log if you can get some sort of value from the log, you know, and magic archer down rather than like your boulder or your uh, barbarian hunt is what I'm thinking. I guess boulder and goblin hunt kind of cost the same. So ideally it's like magic archer log, furnace, or poison is what you want to use to cycle. But of course, you can't always get the best value from that, so if you have to put a bowler down, or if you have to put um, a goblin hut down, go right ahead. But generally you want to save the barbarian hut because it's so expensive for later in the game, for double elixir time, or for once you've got some pumps rolling. So you usually try to cycle early on to get back to your pump, and then you barbarian hut a little bit later in the game once you've got that elixir advantage going, or you got kind of a the you know clear to go ahead and put that down a little bit more safely, because it's a big investment, and you want to make good use of your elixir. You want to make sure that you can get that massive advantage going. You can see I got three pumps here, and then pretty soon we're going to get into double elixir time, and there's just going to be nothing he can do because I'm just going to build up this super massive wave. Uh, with all those spawner buildings, and he'll have nothing to do to be able to answer them. So, Barbarian Hut generally comes later than Double Elixir, or once you've got a big Elixir advantage from multiple pumps. Other than that, you're going to be cycling back to that pump, and baiting out whatever their spell is with your other units, or with your other buildings, or with your big swarm from your other spawner buildings. Alright, so, let's talk about that a little bit more. So, if they're consistently spelling your pump, you build up that swarm, that's one thing that you can do, is you can, you know, see that I have a bunch of spawner buildings on the right there. Sometimes they'll be like, oh, crap, I've got to get rid of this massive wave, and they'll fireball that wave. As soon as you see that, you pump up. They might actually spell, like, a big clump of buildings, too. See how I have a furnace and a barbarian hut down there? And my princess tower and the two goblin huts all close together. Maybe he'll be like, okay, I'm going to fireball that. I don't think this guy has fireball, but if he did... They might, he might be like, okay, I'm going to fireball that. And then you can immediately put your pump down. And it's safe placement. And that's when you start getting that elixir advantage going. So what about offense and what about poison? Well, you always want to poison their pumps. Again, making sure that you have the elixir advantage 
is key. You always want to make sure that you have the elixir advantage late game so you can build up a massive wave. So you cannot allow them to pump up. As soon as you see that pump, poison it. Poison their pump, get that elixir trade, that legal elixir trade, and take that thing out because you cannot allow them to have that elixir advantage. That is absolutely paramount for this deck. And I know I've said that a million times, but that's because it's a million times important. So that's where the poison comes in hand. If they don't have pump, you can use it on something else. You can use it on waves. You can use it there. Like I used it just to ensure the victory. You know, get some more chip damage off on their king tower. It wasn't necessary, but that's generally like the only time that you would use it on something else is if they don't have the elixir pump in their deck. Now, in this particular replay, I made a lot of misplays early on, and you'll see them here. But I managed to pull it together, and this is just another testament to how powerful this deck is for this particular challenge. All right, guys, let's talk about the choice of the two true cards in this deck. Why did I choose Bowler? Why did I choose Magic Archer? And I know I mentioned this earlier, but I want to reiterate it and go into more detail because that's the major difference that Dick, this deck has from the other variation of this deck that I did not too long ago. So instead of Zappies, again, because of the Zappy nerf, and instead of Flying Machine, you've got the Magic Archer and you've got the Bowler. Well, let's talk about the Magic Archer first. He stays alive for a long time, and he snipes from afar. And he attacks really quick, obviously, because of the range challenge. We look at that pro tornado there. That's a really good tornado, and it manages to get the giant skeleton's bomb off on my tower. But anyway, back to the magic archer. He stays alive for a really long twat, a really long time, and he, uh, in doing so, counter spawner decks really well because he'll stay in back and just keep sniping them from afar, just consistently being able to shut down like their furnace and their goblin hut and everything from a really far away safe range. And since you're going up against a lot of other spawner decks, you'll see that. They're going to be having a whole ton of units coming at you, so the Magic Archer will always have something to shoot at, so he'll always stay in the back. And sometimes you can get multiple versions of him, you know, at once. You can get two or three Magic Archers on the field at once if you want to, because they'll stay alive for such a long time because of that massive range. So, he's long range, he works well in the Rage Challenge with that Rage effect, and he counters the other spawner decks really well. Stays alive for a long time. Alright, what about the Bowler? Well, the Boulder has a couple roles. He's an interesting card in this deck. Um, mainly, he counters the spawner decks, too. He does a great job of shutting down those spawner decks and just shutting down the waves because he stays alive. He's pretty tanky, and he just pushes them back. You know, he pushes those barbarians back and just instantly kills, like, the fire spirits and the goblins. And, you know, he rolls his uh, bowling ball in the line, so it just rolls past whatever's in front of him and on to the next you know, spawn unit behind it. So it shuts down those spawner buildings really well. He also plays a tank role, interestingly enough, in this particular deck. You don't really have much to tank in this deck, other than, I guess, the Barbarian spawn for the Barbarian Hunt. So the Bowler kind of plays that mini tank role. So later in the game, once you have a built a hill, uh, I can't speak, a huge wave built up, you can kind of use him at the bridge sometimes even, if not in the back to you know build up a big wave uh, or a big push with him. And, you know, he can play that tank role like I did there. He tanks for everything. Well, the spawner, you know, spawn units from all the spawner buildings just do uh, wreak havoc and just do so much damage on absolutely everything on their tower. You can see at this point, I've built up enough elixir and put on the pressure enough for me to just absolutely cover my right side in spawner buildings. There's nothing really that he can do at this point. And then I can just use the boulder up front to kind of tank and, you know, shut down things like his witch. And I can use the Magic Archer all the way up and to the side, or maybe down there in the back because he's getting a push going. And Magic Archer will stay alive for a really long time. So that is why we have the Magic Archer and the Bowler in this deck rather than the Flying Machine and the Zappies. Now the Zappies got nerfed. You could actually use the Flying Machine. I was having some fun with that particular deck again, even though the Zappies got nerfed. And I have seen other people run the Flying Machine with much success. Uh, so you could definitely run the flying machine in this particular deck if you wanted to, or in you know a variation of this deck, because it'll do really well. It plays a similar role to the magic archer. You know, it's got really long range. It attacks really fast with the rage. It stays alive for a long time. It's got the range support role, and it'll stay alive really long, especially with the huge wave coming from you know your spawner buildings. And if you got the bowler in there to tank as well, it'll stay alive even longer because now it's got a mini tank in it for it. So that is totally an option if you'd rather run a flying machine. Now one thing that is really good to see is 
once you see them do something like, uh, you know, fireball your big wave of units rather than like your pump or your spawner buildings, you know that they're starting to panic and you know that you have the uh, potential to safely put down a pump and you know get in their head a little bit and know that they're not going to be necessarily playing the best because they're like oh man I gotta deal with this massive wave and that's not the best elixir trait. Now he does a good job there of kind of juking me with the miner. I was thinking he was going to put the miner over onto my pump but he ends up sending it into the spawner building and then fireballing that pump there. And you'll notice he's going to fireball my pump a lot. That's his going to be his answer to it. So what I try to do, again, as I mentioned earlier, is bait that fireball out. You know, and he ends up using it on, uh, I think, a wave at one point. And, you know, at that point, it's just like, okay, cool. Now I can safely put down that pump, get the elixir advantage rolling, and just absolutely stomp him later in the game. Alright, so I explained the reason behind the two troop cards. And I explained why we replaced the flying machine and the zappies. Um, so let's talk more about this deck. This deck has this huge beatdown potential, and I've mentioned this a lot. You don't really have a traditional, you know, beatdown like Giant Witch kind of archetype going, but you do have the potential to uh, build up a huge wave and just absolutely stomp your opponent. So that being said, don't be afraid to lose a tower early on. As long as you pump up, as I said 500 million times already, and you build up that elixir advantage, you will wreck. You will wreck them. And I did this challenge, I got two losses early on. One of them I messed up, and one of them my phone crashed or ran out of battery or something as I was doing all right. And I went from two losses and two wins all the way up to 12 wins with this deck. And there were so many instances where I was like, ah, oh, dude, I can't do this. Like, I've lost already, I'm playing poorly, and I'm, I'm gonna lose this match for sure, but, I was wrong. Like, I lost the tower early on, and I am I get tilted, but then I'm like, okay, wait, you've come back before with this deck. You know this deck has big comeback potential, so just hang tight, be patient, and you know, you never know. You might, you might get a huge comeback. You might get a huge wave going and just, you know, absolutely stomp him. And with that mindset, I'll almost always go for the three crown victory, and you'll probably, you've probably noticed that already in a lot of these replays. Um, because you can build up this huge, massive wave. Look at that. I just fully commit to the right there, and I can just absolutely, absolutely obliterate not only his Princess Tower, but just continue right through to the King Tower, because he keeps trying to answer the wave, and the wave just gets bigger and bigger. So, uh, to reiterate, as long as you pump up, you will wreck. So do not be afraid to lose the tower early on. Sometimes you can just let them send in their hog or whatever like this, and just pump up in the opposite side, and just be like, all right, I'm going to lose that tower. It's not a big deal. That was a really good placement on that bowler there. I just want to point that out. If you put the bowler right directly below the tower like that, he will actually completely destroy all three goblins of, go of a goblin barrel with one bowling ball, with one boulder. Um, and in that particular case, he also pushed back the hog, because the bowler is a great sh uh, counter to the hog as well. So big beatdown deck. Don't be afraid to lose a tower, because you're going to pump up, you're going to get a big push going, and you're going to wreck them. Alright, late game. I mentioned this again, but late game, your opponent might start panicking, and they might spell your wave, they might use their fireball or their poison or their lightning on your big wave, rather than using it on your pump. And again, I know I've mentioned this, but it's because it's so important. As soon as you see that, guys, that's the option, that, or that's the opportunity for you to put a pump down safely and get the elixir advantage rolling. Safe placement of pumps, and if you don't want to put the pumps down, you want to get the big wave going already, or you want to keep continuing to commit to your wave, uh, because it's late game or something like that, or you've got a massive wave going already, then you can continue to put down spawner buildings. You can see there I had three pumps down, and he only was able to fireball one of the three. So in that case, I've gotten three down already, so even though I lost the tower here, I'm getting this elixir advantage rolling consistently as the game goes on. So that's pretty much it as far as strategy goes, guys. I'm just going to show you this last replay. This is the second to the last one. And then there's going to be one more after this, and that is the last match that actually got me the 12 wins. And so I'm just going to talk about the particular matches and interactions from here on out, um, rather than you know the strategies and everything that I had behind the deck. So here you can see that um, I'm putting the pumps uh, can, consistently. I'm going to be putting them far away from each other most of the time. Uh, I want to say consistently, but maybe I'm wrong. You know, point me out if I'm wrong. 
most of the time you want to be putting them far away from each other if possible. Because then if he does... Oh, there it is. You can see he fireballed my wave rather than my bullets. Anyway, back to what I was saying. If he does decide to fireball one of my pumps, then he'll only be able to hit one of them rather than two or three of them. If I have one on the far right and one on the far left. Or one kind of in that sweet little rocket spot right above your king tower to the left a little bit, and then one in the far right, or so on and so forth. And you can kind of start to put things in unconventional spots with this deck, because you're just going to be building up this massive wave, and honestly you're going to start running out of room in some instances. And again, here's an instance of that where I'm just building so many buildings in the right side, I'm going for the three crown victory there, and again he fireballs the wave, and then there's just more elixir for me to spend on, you know, putting down spawner buildings. And I accidentally messed up the placement of, of that furnace there, but it doesn't matter, because I have so much stuff going, and if he decides to fireball all my spawner buildings, then my wave is just going to absolutely obliterate him. So there's pretty much nothing that he could do at that point. Uh, the wave just plowed through and did its job. Alright guys, this is it. This is the 12th win, the last match that got me the 12 wins in this Rage Challenge with this spawner troll deck with the magic archer and the boulder in it. Now you can see here I'm generally going to be opening up with like the furnace or something cheap like that. You could also open up with like your magic archer or something in the back. Ideally you're going to be opening up with a pump if you have it. That can be a little bit risky because they might push the opposite lane or the same lane even and try to get a tower and they often will get a tower if you pump up early. But again it's about getting that elixir advantage and going for the big push late game. So I'm like, okay, big deal. I lost the tower. I've lost the tower a bunch of times already in a bunch of other matches, um, you know, early on. And it's not a big deal. And this guy isn't running a spawner deck, so I feel like, okay, there's a chance that if I just kind of play safe, play defensively, I can get that elixir advantage going and just build up a massive wave and just obliterate him. I have to answer that balloon, I think, so I decided I'm going to put the Magic Archer there, and you'll notice that the Magic Archer has such a massive range that you can put him in a safe spot in the right lane there, and he'll shoot all the way over to the left lane there with ease. Some units have a shorter range box, and they'll run away, or you'll have to time it perfectly. You know, the, the balloon would have to have been a lot closer, but with the Magic Archer, because of his massive range, it's not a big deal. He's able to shoot it from afar, no problem. And that, again, plays to your advantage in this particular deck. You can see here that I'm cycling back to the pumps, and you can see what I was saying about putting one pump in the far left, one in the far right. And I decided to use the boulder to, you know, kind of do that mini tank roll. I'm like, okay, we're getting towards double elixir time, you got two pumps up, so I'm going to start building up a push. So, I start putting down another barbarian hut, and I get another goblin hut. And I had that boulder down, but at this point there's really no need. He gives me a wow. And man, if you have rage in this deck, you could rage on top of all of that, but there's no need because everything is permanently raged. And that is the advantage of this particular deck, or this archetype, in this challenge. You can see there, the wave just gets so big and everything so, attacks so fast because it's permanently raged. And that effect just stacks up so well when you have multiple units rather than just one big heavy unit. That that gives you this potential for these spawn decks to do so well. I um, mean, this is something I read when I first started playing Clash Royale a long time ago. I read online, somebody was talking about how like they found that the rage effect actually works better with you know a lot of fast attacking units rather than like a big heavy unit like a P.E.K.K.A. It works really well with like a witch with a bunch of little skeletons that attacks really fast. Alright guys, that is it for this new version of this Rage Challenge Spawner Troll deck. I hope that you guys enjoy it. I was so happy to get 12 wins with it. Thanks so much for watching guys. <laughs>